EWP progression work that we are doing. Alex Davis Jones. Mr. Speaker, next week we come together to recognise National Fertility Week. Yesterday I had the great opportunity to meet with Fertility First, we're a fantastic charity providing um, information to everyone who requires fertility treatment. What more can the Minister do to ensure we get fair and equal access to fertility treatment for everyone who needs it in the UK? I thank uh, the Honourable Lady for raising that. That's something that I'd be very happy to meet with her uh, to discuss in due course. As she will know I've only returned to the role for a few hours, so I don't have a full answer for her, but I'm very happy to work with her on the issue. Richards. Mr Speaker, what is the Secretary of State's response to the allegations made yesterday following her appointment by Ben Cohen of Pink News? Uh, Mr. Speaker, if, Mr. Speaker, if I may, I know everyone wants to start uh, PMQs very quickly, so please forgive me if my answer is a tad longer than it ordinarily w- w- would be. Um, I'm afraid that this particular individual is someone who uses uh, Twitter as a tool for defamation. He has even sued people in this house, like the Honourable Member for Edinburgh West. And I think what is, uh, oh, he's been sued by, pardon me, uh, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh West. What I would like to say, Mr. Speaker, as we do begin a new era of equalities, is that the equality Act is a shield, not a sword. It is there to protect people of all characteristics, whether they are young or old, male or female, black or white, gay or straight. We are uh, running a compassionate equality strategy, and we should not be distracted by people who use Twitter as a way to insult or accuse members of Parliament. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We start with questions to Prime Minister. In welcoming the Prime Minister, I call Dr Alan Whitehead. Question one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this can I just say, don't damage the furniture. Cheering by all means, but don't damage. Come on. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this house, I shall have further such meetings later today. I'd like to congratulate the Prime Minister on his uh, new post, and indeed, uh, as being the. Uh, first uh, Prime Minister of a South Asian uh, heritage, uh, which I think will be a cause of great pride among many of my constituents. Uh, I also have uh, some pride in welcoming a fellow Saints Southampton supporter uh, into number 10. Um, during uh, During his Prime Ministerial campaigns, the last Prime Ministerial campaign he ran, he, <laughs> he pledged to prohibit any development of onshore wind, which is now the cheapest form of power available to us in the country. Now he is Prime Minister. Will he change his mind on that point? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, uh, M- Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, kind words and look forward to seeing him at St Mary's, although uh, I know my, my friend, the, uh, the Leader of the House, may have something to say about our love of, uh, uh, of saints. Look, when it comes to energy policy, I stick by what we said uh, in our manifesto, Mr Speaker. The important thing is, though, to focus on our long-term energy security. That means more renewables, more offshore wind and, indeed, more nuclear. That's what this Government will deliver. I'm surprised, Mr Speaker, to be uh, asking a question, and I know you're shocked, Mr Speaker, too, because I know that you, uh, like many people, thought I would have already been offered a ministerial post. Let me tell you, I didn't hold my breath. Philip Davis. (laughs) Go go figure, as Joe Biden might say. uh, <laughs> can I can I can I congratulate can I congratulate my right honourable friend on becoming Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah. He's absolutely the right person for the job and I wish him every success in post and as he knows he's got my full support. He's, he's too, he's too, he's, he's, His two immediate predecessors made levelling up a key part of their agenda. Would he reaffirm his commitment to levelling up and start as he means to go on by approving the levelling up fund bid for Bingley in my constituency? Well, I'm... uh 
I'm, I'm, great, I'm grateful to my uh, honourable friend uh, for his, his warm remarks. I can confirm he must be the, the only person, Mr Speaker, who texted me to say that he did not want a job <laughs> in the last 24 hours. Uh, but I can give him my cast iron commitment to levelling up, particularly in Yorkshire, which he and I share. Uh, obviously, he'll, he'll know I can't comment on individual bids, but by the end of the year, an announcement is expected on the success, and I wish him uh, every luck with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and may I welcome the Prime Minister. The first British Asian Prime Minister is a significant moment in our national story, and it's a reminder that for all the challenges we face as a country, Britain is a place where people of all races and all beliefs can fulfil their dreams. That's not true in every country, and many didn't, and many didn't think that they would live to see the day when it would be true here. It's part of what makes us all so proud to be British. Was his Home Secretary right to resign last week for a breach of security? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Ronald Wood gentleman for for his kind and indeed generous uh, welcome to the dispatch box. I look forward to Prime Minister's question time with him, and I know that we will have no doubt robust exchanges, but I hope that they can also be serious and grown up. So I look forward to it. Well, uh, he he asked uh, about the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised that. She raised the matter and she accepted her mistake. And that's why... That's why I was delighted to welcome back into a united cabinet that brings experience and stability to the heart of government. And let me tell you, Mr Speaker, what the Home Secretary will be focused on. She'll be focused on cracking down on criminals, on defending our borders, while the party opposite remains soft on crime and in favour of unlimited immigration. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and promised integrity, professionalism and accountability. But then, with his first act, he appointed a Home Secretary who was sacked by his predecessor a week ago for deliberately pinging around sensitive Home Office documents from her personal account. Far from soft on crime, I ran the Crown Prosecution Service for five years. with Home Secretaries to take on terrorists and serious organised crime. And I know firsthand how important it is that we have a Home Secretary whose integrity and professionalism are beyond question. So, have officials raised concerns about his decision to appoint her? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I just addressed the issue with the Home Secretary, but but he uh, but he talked about fighting crime. I would hope, I would hope, Mr. Speaker, I would hope that he would welcome. I would hope, I would hope that as we look forward, he would welcome the news today that there are over 15,000 new police officers on our street. And the Home Secretary will be supporting them to tackle burglaries. While the party opposite, the party opposite will be backing the lunatic protesting fringe that are stopping working people going about their lives. Yes, Starmer. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I listened carefully. That was clearly not a no. We can all see what's happened here. He's so weak. He's done a grubby deal trading national security because he was scared to lose another leadership election. There's a new Tory at the top, but as always with them, party first, country second. Yesterday, yesterday, on the steps of Downing Street, he also admitted what the whole country knows. The Tories have crashed the economy and now somebody has to pay for their mess. I say it shouldn't be working people who have been hammered time and again by this lot, but those with the broadest shoulders must step up. Does he agree? Well, well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman talked about party first and country second. Perhaps he could explain to us why it was a few years ago he was supporting the member for Islington North. (laughs) 
Mr. Speaker, uh, my record is clear. When times are difficult in this country, I will always protect the most vulnerable. That is the values of our compassionate party. We did it in COVID and we will do that again. Mr Speaker, he says he'll protect the most vulnerable. Let's test that. The government currently allows very rich people to live here but register abroad for tax purposes. I don't need to explain to the Prime Minister how non-dom status works. He already knows all about that. It costs the Treasury £3.2 billion every year. Why doesn't he put his mouth where his money where his mouth is and get rid of it? Well, Mr Speaker, I have been honest. We will have to take difficult decisions to restore economic stability and confidence. And my honourable friend, the Chancellor, will set that out in an autumn statement in just a few weeks. But what I can say, as we did during COVID, we will always protect the most vulnerable. We will do this in a fair way. But what I can say, I am glad, Mr Speaker, that the party opposite, honourable gentleman, has finally realised that spending does need to be paid for. For the party opposite, this government is going to restore economic stability, and we will do it in a fair and compassionate way. I know he's been away for a few weeks, but he should have listened to what's been going on the last two. But anyway, I, I, I have to say, I'm surprised he's still defending non-dom status. He pretends he's on the side of working people, but in private, he says something very different. Over the summer, he was secretly recorded at a garden party in Tunbridge Wells, boasting to a group of Tory members that he personally moved money away from deprived areas to wealthy places instead. Rather than apologise or pretend that he meant something else, why doesn't he now do the right thing and undo the changes that he made to those funding formulas? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I know. I know. I, I, I know the right. I know the right honourable gentleman rarely leaves North London. But if he does, but if he, if he does, he will know that there are deprived areas in our rural communities. In our and across the South, and this government will relentlessly support them because we are a government that will deliver for people across the United Kingdom. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he mentioned the last few weeks. I am the first to admit that mistakes were made, and that's the reason I am standing here. But that, but that is the difference between him and me. This summer, I was talking, I was being honest about the difficulties that we were facing. But when he ran for leader, when he ran for leader, he promised his party he would borrow billions and billions of pounds. I told the truth for the good of the country. He told his party what it wanted to hear. Leadership is not selling fairy tales. It is confronting challenges, and that is the leadership the British people will get from this government. Mr Speaker, I think everyone should watch the video and make their own minds up. In public, he claims he wants to level up the North, but then he boasts about trying to funnel vital investment away from deprived areas. He says one thing and does another. But they're shouting. They're not my words. They're not my words. They're the words of the former chair of the Tory party, sacked yesterday for telling the truth about the Prime Minister. Even his own side know he's not on the side of working people. That's why the only time he ran in a competitive election, he got trounced by the former Prime Minister, who herself got beaten by a lettuce. <laughs> so why doesn't he put it to the test, let working people have their say and call a general election? Well, it'll take a long time to get through this paper if we carry on like this, Prime Minister. M Mr Speaker, he talks about mandates, about votes, about elections. It's a bit rich coming from the person who tried to overturn the biggest democratic vote in our country's history. Our, our mandate.
today is based on the manifesto that we were elected on to remind him an election that we won and they lost. A mandate that says we want a stronger NHS, better schools, safer streets, control of our borders and levelling up. That is the mandate that I and this government will deliver for the British people. There's not even asked her questions. You want more? Come on, Heather. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to congratulate our new, my right honourable friends, our new Prime Minister, and also to thank our previous Prime Minister for the straightforward way she has handled her resignation. And I wish her and her family well for the future. Yeah. Would my right honourable friend please use this, his first appearance of the dispatch box, to make it clear to the British Medical Council and the British Dental Association that as well as training, more, more training spaces opening up, that they must allow new doctors and dentists to work in the UK so that the good people of South Derbyshire can get treatment on the NHS? Well, I thank, uh, I thank my honourable friend for her question. She's absolutely right. I'm pleased that there are 3,500 more doctors and over 9,000 more nurses working this year than last. But she's right, and we are working to simplify the registration for dentists in particular that are not trained here to practice here. And that's how we'll help deliver a long term workforce plan for the NHS and ensure everyone can get the care they need. Let's come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I congratulate the new Prime Minister on becoming the first British Asian to hold the office. The significance and the symbolism of this achievement is to be warmly welcomed by everyone. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yesterday on the steps of Downing Street, the new Prime Minister promised to bring, and I quote, compassion to the challenges that we face today. So, on his first full day in the job, let's put that to the test. A winter of uncertainty is coming, and next April we'll see a cliff-edge moment. Millions face a double whammy as the energy price guarantee is cut off, while households are hit by austerity 2.0 and a real terms cut to social security benefits that many rely on to survive. If people are actually to trust the new Prime Minister's words about compassion, will he today reassure people and guarantee that benefits will rise in line with inflation yeah, yeah. in his upcoming budget? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, again kind, kind remarks. And what I can tell him is, my record on this is clear. Through the difficult times that we faced in this country yeah, yeah. through COVID, I always acted in a way to protect the most vulnerable. Yeah. That's because it is the right thing to do, and those are the values of our compassionate party. Yeah. And I can absolutely reassure him and give him that commitment that we will continue to act like that in the weeks ahead. Yeah, black <laughs> well, there we go. Well, Mr Speaker, let's test that, because as Chancellor, the Prime Minister slashed universal credit yep. and presided over the worst levels well, you know, for, the, for the hard of hearing on the Tory side, I might remind them that universal credit was cut by £20 a week and presided over the worst levels of poverty in North West Europe. So I hope that he has learned from his mistakes and guarantees that benefits will rise in line with inflation. But speaking of mistakes, yesterday the Prime Minister appointed a Home Secretary who was forced to resign only last week for breaching the ministerial code and who boasted, boasted that she dreamed of sending vulnerable asylum seekers to Rwanda. We all know why he appointed her a sleazy backroom deal to shore up his own position. Far from being a fresh start, this is a return to the sleaze and scandal and ghosts yeah, yeah, of Cabinet's yeah, yeah. past. The Prime Minister promised to govern with integrity and humility. So if he has an ounce of either, will he admit his mistake and sack the Home Secretary sack without the delay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I was pleased to actually have a call last night with the First Minister of Scotland. It was important that I spoke to her on my first day in office because I wanted to express my desire to work constructively with the Scottish Government so that we can work together to deliver for the people of Scotland, and that is what I plan to do. And indeed, I hope crime is one of the things that we can collaborate on because he will know that violent crime is rising in Scotland and police numbers are falling, whereas here we are increasing police numbers, Mr Speaker. But I look forward, I look forward to working with the Scottish Government on our shared challenges because I believe in a strong United Kingdom. Yeah. Dr Andrew Murray, sir. 
Mr Speaker, what a pleasure it was to welcome the Prime Minister to my constituency in the summer. He will know one of the burning issues in my constituency is the proposed waste incinerator at Westbury. With the Government rightly reviewing its air quality targets, can I ask my right honourable friend to signal his intent to continue promoting public health, net zero and the environment by placing a moratorium on any more unwanted, unnecessary, toxic waste burners. Prime Minister, uh, that, I can tell my honourable friend, I know he's been a vociferous campaign on this issue, as I, uh, as I learned over the summer. He'll know that local authorities determine these issues, but also to reassure him that all large incinerators in England must comply with strict emission limits and only receive permits if plants don't cause any damage to human health, and hopefully that is reassuring for him. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister's reckless predecessor took a wrecking ball to nature, prompting millions of members of the RSPB, the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust to rise up in opposition. Yesterday, he promised to fix her mistakes as well as to uphold the party's 2019 manifesto. So if he is a man of his word, will he start by reversing the green light she gave to fracking since it's categorically not been shown to be safe, and instead maintain the moratorium that was pledged in that very moratorium, in that very manifesto that he has promised to uphold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I've, I've already said I, I stand by the manifesto on that. But I, what I would say is that I'm proud that this government has passed the landmark Environment Act, yeah. putting more for the natural environment than we've ever had, with a clear plan to deliver. And I can give the Honourable Lady my commitment that we will deliver on all those ambitions. We will deliver on what we said at COP, because we care deeply about passing our children an environment in better state than we found it ourselves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too would like to welcome the Prime Minister to his place. Farmers in my constituency of Cluid South are delighted that after 20 years they are once more able to sell Welsh lamb to the US market. Would the Prime Minister comment on the size and prospects of this market for our world-beating Welsh lamb? Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, I congratulate my, uh, my colleague on the fantastic achievement. I can tell him that market is worth, I think, something like almost £40 million over the first few years. Enormous boost uh, for our lamb farmers. I would just encourage the 300 million US consumers to give Yorkshire Swaledale a lamb a look in <laughs> as, uh, as well. But I know he and I, if we disagree on that, are united on the fact that we will unequivocally back British farming and British farmers. Yeah. Janet Davey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is certainly a topsy-turvy Tory government. A few days ago, I was going to put my question to the former Prime Minister, but my inbox has been full of emails from constituents of Lewisham East writing to me about their desperate situation, of their wages simply not going far enough. I'm also receiving emails about rents going up, energy prices going up, mortgages going up, and of course the cost of living is already up. This week, my constituents are writing to me demanding a general election, and I absolutely agree with them. So can the Prime Minister tell me and my constituents when there will be a general election? Mr Speaker, we've already addressed that, but I would say, as I said in the summer, as I said in the summer, I said inflation is indeed the enemy. It makes everyone poorer, it erodes savings, and that's why it will be a priority of our government to grip and reduce inflation and provide support to those who need it as we do. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This autumn I'm launching my campaign to extend the Chilterns area of natural beauty across thousands of acres of scenic beauty, chalk streams and valuable habitats that happen to surround the wonderful town of Hitchin in my constituency. Would the Prime Minister join me in celebrating areas protected by AOMB status and indeed support my campaign to potentially extend them in rural Hertfordshire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I thank my uh, honourable friend because I know this is uh, a matter of great importance to him and his constituents. And he's right to highlight the benefit that natural parks and AOMBs can bring to our lives and our well-being. Uh, I understand actually that Natural England is considering an extension of the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty, and I know my honourable friend will be vigorously taking up his campaign with them. Richard Burger. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the Prime Minister to his place. 
A nurse would have to work over 20,000 years in order to match the vast wealth of this Prime Minister. The Prime Minister knows all... The Prime Minister knows only too well that the super-rich could easily afford to pay more in taxes. So rather than announce a new wave of cuts and austerity, wouldn't it be fairer for the Prime Minister to introduce wealth taxes on the very richest in our society? Well, th Mr Speaker, we will always support our hard-working nurses, and that's why, as Chancellor, we reintroduced the nurses' bursary and provided more training and introduced, actually, very strong pay increases. But, as I committed to previously, as we approach the difficult decisions that confront us, we will do so in a way that is fair and is compassionate, because those are our values, and that's what we will deliver. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's determination to be straight with people about the challenges we face as a country. Last week, the Care Quality Commission State of Care report and State of Care in England showed our health system in gridlock. And I hear the same from my constituents, struggling to see a GP or waiting for treatment. So can I urge him to make unblocking the NHS a priority for him and his health secretary. So, well, uh, my, my honourable friend knows this subject obviously very well from her own experience, and I thank her for the work she did previously in the department. She's absolutely right about the challenge that confronts us. It's why we've put billions of pounds into busting the backlogs and the elective recovery fund and are delivering funding and staffing to do that. But I look forward to working with her to deliver what we said in our manifesto, and that is a far stronger NHS. Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would uh, add my own congratulations to the Prime Minister on his appointment. So we might not agree on everything, but uh, I think we can all agree a more diverse politics can only be to the good. Yeah. Now, we on these benches believe that Scotland's best future is independence in Europe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I really would urge the members opposite to show a little more respect, because it's not just us. It's not just us. It's not just the SNP, and I will not be shouted down. It's not just the SNP. On the last opinion poll, 72% of the people of Scotland want back into the European Union. So if the Prime Minister is to maintain any credibility in the eyes of the people of Scotland, how long does he think he can deny Scotland's democracy? Mr Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Gentleman for his kind words. I mean, he, talked, he talked about respect. I would gently urge him to respect the result of the referendum we had on this topic. Uh, but whilst Whilst we, whilst, we will, whilst we will disagree on that issue, I can tell him that I do remain committed to working constructively in partnership with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. Mark Eastwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week I visited worried Year 3 and 6 pupils to hear their suggestions to tackle road safety following a number of serious road accidents outside Boothroyd Academy in Dewsbury. They suggested the Council should do more to help, that their parents should walk them to school to reduce traffic and that commuters should slow down. Would my right hon. Friend agree with me and with them that we all have a part to play in ensuring road safety outside our schools? Yeah. Can, I, uh, can I say to my hon. Friend, I think it's fantastic that he's engaging with his younger constituents at Boothroyd Academy on such an important issue, and I know they will welcome his commitment to supporting them. And I agree with him. There are various things we can do. There's an updated highway code which strengthens pedestrian access. Local authorities can introduce lower speed limits, and we're increasing the number of school streets, which restrict motorised traffic at busy times. And I look forward to hearing progress on this issue from him. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Prime Minister stood on the steps of Downing Street and said that he wanted to restore trust. Uh, yet in the past 24 hours, we've seen that he's prepared to shamelessly swap uh, red boxes for political support. And there are real serious consequences to all this horse trading. So I'd like him to be clear on this point. Did he seek or receive any advice on security concerns about the Right Honourable Member for South Staffordshire before his appointment to the government yesterday, given that he was sacked in 2019 for leaking sensitive information relating to our national security? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, 
Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, he's talking, he's talking about events that happened uh, four years ago, and he's talking. Well, he's talking. He's talking. He's right that he raised. He's right that he raised the topic of national security because members, members opposite four years ago were busily supporting the member for Islington North, who wanted to abolish the nuclear deterrent, who wanted to leave NATO, and who wanted to scrap our armed forces. We won't take any lectures on national security, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I sincerely congratulate my right honourable friend and wish him every success. Over three years ago, my constituent Harry Dunn was killed in a tragic road accident, and I'd like to ask my right honourable friend to join me in congratulating Harry Dunn's family for the incredible campaign they've run for over three years, with huge support from all colleagues across the House, on finally achieving justice for Harry. Yeah, thank, well, I, uh, I pay tribute to my right honourable friend for her role, and indeed the former Foreign Secretary as well, uh, and indeed colleagues from all over the House for the part they've played in bringing about this outcome. Uh, my thoughts are obviously with the family, and I join in her sentiments that this is very welcome. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, West Hertfordshire Hospital Trust in my area is still hoping to receive funds from the new hospitals programme, the same programme that is supposed to deliver the government's so-called 40 new hospitals. There has been a lot of speculation that the new Prime Minister and his Chancellor might seek to cut infrastructure projects. So, Can the Prime Minister confirm to me that my local hospital trust, as well as all of the other local hospital trusts that are set to benefit from the new hospitals programme, will in fact get that money, yes or no? Well, well, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor will set out our plans in the autumn statement shortly, but this is the Government that put in place plans which will remain to significantly increase capital expenditure, and even though difficult decisions do need to be made, I think the country can rest assured that we will continue to invest in our future productivity and indeed invest in our public services like the NHS. Wendy Ball. Uh, Mr Speaker, in my... constituency were at risk of 8,000 new homes being dumped in the constituency. Will my right honourable friend use the opportunity of this Prime Minister's question to reaffirm the Government's commitment to, the, to protecting the Greenbelt and to adopting a really rigorous brownfield first policy? Yeah, yeah. Well, can I, uh, can I say thank you to my honourable friend for her question? Uh, and I did. I can give her that assurance. She's absolutely right. We must protect our green belt, and we are adopting a brownfield first strategy. I'm pleased we had a record number of new homes built in the last year, but it's important that we build those homes in the right places. Luke Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whilst welcoming the new Prime Minister to his place, we remember that law breaking was the order of the day in Downing Street during the pandemic. We will never forget that this current <coughs> Prime Minister was fined by the police for attending a birthday party hosted by his next door neighbour. As both a witness and a participant to that law breaking, if the Privileges Committee investigation into the former Prime Minister calls him to give evidence, Will he fully cooperate? Yes. Yeah. 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 Minister. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, and I addressed these matters earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 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 Mr. Mr. Speaker, you will know that I fought hard to bring back Boris. In 1997, I campaigned for Kenneth Clark and then for Michael Portillo. <laughs> so I can't always get it right. <laughs> But you know, I do know about the West Midlands. I know that the West Midlands Mayor very much welcomes the reappointment of the Leveling Up Secretary and that he looks forward to working with our new Prime Minister. So may I just ask him, what is his vision for levelling up? Well, I, uh, I, thank, I thank my uh, honourable friend for the question. And, and what I can say, is our desire is to ensure that people, wherever they live in our fantastic country, have enormous pride in the place they call home and every opportunity to succeed. And you know what? It is the fantastic Mayor Andy Street who is delivering that for his constituents in the West Midlands. That completes questions.
Right, let us come to the urgent question.